So you've done thousands of these leak code questions and you probably taught more people in the world than almost anyone DSA. <laughs> you know, in the preparation for this call, we were talking about how you've kind of boiled down out of all the problems that you could possibly encounter in data, data structure algorithm interview, you boil it down into kind of five core concepts. I'm curious how you did that. And, you know, when you think about these five core ideas that we'll talk about, what kind of coverage will that give you if you're preparing for a DSA interview. Right on. Yeah. And I think, you know, before we, we hop into those, like, you know, five concrete topics, I think first off, I think a lot of people would be surprised by that kind of descriptor, you know, because when you go on a course, any course in data structures and algorithms, there are a ton of problems. You go on lead code, ton of problems. They're very overwhelming. And those types of patterns are not immediately apparent. And so I think the number one sentiment that I would give anyone if they're trying to learn data structures and algorithms is to focus on these fundamental patterns. Because before you can even worry about these more esoteric algorithms, like topological sort or like Dijkstra's algorithm, that what underlies those advanced concepts is like these core fundamentals. So you almost have no business trying to learn those things that only give you optimizations for like a very small minority of problems. You should really focus on these like bread and butter algorithms that will, you know, feed you through your entire career uh, in terms of solving yeah. DSNA problems. But I think, you know, that the first two algorithms on like my list of like patterns that, hey, you got to know are going to be your depth first search and your breadth first search. And here I don't make any discrimination between like, all right, doing a DFS or BFS for a tree or graph. Like if you know how to do it for a graph, you most certainly know how to do it for a tree. I think where people don't really make the connection between like how much coverage you can get out of these traditionally like graph search algorithms is how much they relate to other problems. For example, in just the general recursive sense, even for like your dynamic programming problems, you know, when you're searching for like an optimal path in terms of like, you know, filling up a knapsack with certain weighted items, you're doing a type of like depth first search. So I think uh, when students are able to make that sort of connection, if you're good at like depth first search for graphs, you're also getting good at like these sort of dynamic programming problems. I think once students and start to realize that sort of thing, that's when they start making a stride. Hey, like studying this pattern doesn't make me just good at this particular problem. It's connected to all these other concepts. There are two things that I think you're commenting on, which are really important. One is that the shape of the problem is often similar in ways that people don't understand where it's, okay, it looks like this, but actually it turns out to fundamentally be a problem about DFS or BFS. So mm -hmm. I think that's like a really big insight that, you know, it really does boil down to these core concepts and you have to master them. It's not just about, oh, I kind of know it. You have to really go deeper. And that, that's kind of the other thing that struck me is that, you know, I imagine most people watching, they feel like they know, I know breadth first search, I know depth first search. I've, at least they have heard of it. A lot of, the, a lot of people watching will think they know it. And I think what you're saying is that there's probably a level of depth to that understanding that people don't actually have. And so I'm wondering, is that how common is that where people think they know something they don't actually know it that well? And how would someone watching test their yeah. the depth of their understanding? So I, I totally have you know witnessed that in my time teaching, you know, folks in person as well as remotely through videos, people who are, you know, more novice in this topic, they don't know what they don't know. And I'd argue that that's more dangerous walking into an interview, right? If you think that you're great at like, you know, these, these graph problems, then you walk into your interview and you have this massive gap if you're not able to immediately identify this problem as like a hidden graph problem, then you're not even like looking in the right area in your toolkit. If you don't have the right tool in mind, there's no chance you're going to be able to solve it. Especially if you're aiming these kind of you know, fan companies, they really have a high standard for like what is correct, what is optimal. I think when it comes to like self-assessing and measuring, like, hey, do I really know this material is? For one, can you solve these problems in sort of a new way. In other words, there's somewhat a uh, sentiment of like, all right, when I'm studying, I feel like I'm just like memorizing problems versus like when I'm studying, I can do a new problem and relate it to something I've previously seen before. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, just the narrative around a problem should not really affect a software engineer's ability to solve it, right? So whether I say, oh, you know, I have this map of cities and there are roads between them, that should not like throw off uh, a software engineer if I change the problem to like, oh, I have these bus stops and, you know, this fair between my different bus stops, right? Those are fundamentally the same underlying data structure, right? That's why we call it data structures and algorithms. So I think the ability and the measure to actually be fluent in these topics is to be able to kind of cut through all of the noise and immediately identify a problem as like, hey, this problem is about weighing oranges, but it's really like a dynamic programming problem. Those are the first two. I love that depth first search and breadth first search, two out of five of the core ideas that you've come across from the years you've been teaching. You mentioned dynamic programming. Can you talk sure. about that one as the, the yeah. concept? 
everyone's favorite, right? Everybody loves yeah. dynamic programming. Uh, so first off, I think in my experience, once being like a student of the algorithm game and, you know, studying for my own job at Google and also teaching a bunch of folks on how to do the same, man, like dynamic programming is probably like the final boss. It's very non-intuitive if folks don't learn it the correct way. And it's something that people avoid, but it's so common in like the zeitgeist of preparing for data structures and algorithms that people know they have to eventually travel into the belly of the beast. But yeah, when it comes to like dynamic programming, I think it's important to keep your, your toolkit like lean and mean. So like I've chosen, you know, these five topics because I think they give you the most coverage. At the same time, I think like focusing on everything also means focusing on nothing. So you go around lists on the web, people will say they're seven, maybe they're 10, maybe they're 20. But I think the more topics you add, the less masterful you know, you're know you gonna be with any of these things. Oh. Most people do not have three years to prepare for their job hunt, right? You need to study up in three months and you wanna do the best you can, right? You can't make your company wait a year to interview all the time. So when it comes to dynamic programming, I teach like the recursive flavor of dynamic programming using memoization. It's actually one of my most popular videos on like the free code camp channel has millions of views, right? And for one, I think that's great to do because you get to leverage your existing understanding of recursion because there is no way you're walking into like a DSNA interview. If you don't know recursion, you're not going to survive, right? Some problems will mandate recursion. And so by solving your DP problems using memoization, you're able to like double dip into your understanding of recursion. Mm -hmm. And it fits like so nicely into your framework of like, all right, if I'm doing some type of recursion, hey, that's always going to be a type of depth first search, right? Recursion goes down the stack before it hits the base case. It's most certainly depth first. And I think those kind of connections is why I consider like dynamic programming via like memoization and recursion is like really, really nice to have in your toolkit. Again, you could learn the iterative flavor, but to me, that's more of like a dissimilar pattern in that you'll be specializing a little bit more. Whereas like that'll take more time. You could do that if you like. I don't recommend it. I'd rather be like really lean and mean with what I master coming into an interview. Yeah, I do think that focus really does help preventing getting overwhelmed. That's a very common thing that I have certainly felt which is like, okay, there's a, all those lists online. There's like the blind 150 or the leaflet. Yeah. Whatever. It's like, I have to do 150 problems. So I, I like this idea of really boiling it down to the five core ideas. Mm -hmm. We went straight to, you know, the belly of the beast with dynamic programming. Let's come back out and talk about a related concept, which is recursive, about recursion and recursive backtracking. Is right. that topic number four you outlined. Can you talk about that? Sure. Yeah. So backtracking, I think folks have heard and Something that I kind of have, have not always seen when, when teaching students is people should really be making a strong connection with like, if I look at some code, how do I know it's like backtracking? First of all, like hopefully folks know that it must be recursive, right? Backtracking is typically a programming term when it comes to like recursion. And it's also recursion where there are like multiple branches, meaning from like some function call, you're making multiple recursive calls. So you might have a for loop and you have a recursive call inside. If that for loop iterates five times, you're probably making five recursive calls that branch out of there, right? And like the, the backtracking aspect comes from the fact that probably put like an if statement around, you know, that recursive call because that allows you to backtrack, right? Backtracking is this pattern where we try, maybe we make a short-term decision and it might not work out in the long term. We don't just want to fail the problem. We have to backtrack, so return up the call stack and make a different decision higher up in that decision tree, right? So that to me is recursive backtracking. But again, it's really a type of depth for search. You just put an if statement around, you know, the recursive call. So that almost like prescriptive descriptor of like what backtracking is, I think it really helps students unlock the fact that you probably already know backtracking. You just didn't know what it looked like in code. Let's talk about that last one, the fifth core idea which is two pointer. Mm. Can you talk about awesome. that? Awesome. Yeah, sure. So two pointer, you know, we're saying that this is like the, the fifth and final um, uh, core pattern on our list. And that's because I tend to group things together. For example, some other things that people might not see on this list are things like matrix traversal. To me, that's just a type of like depth first or, or breadth first search, right? You can argue that it's the same algorithm. You just use, you know, adjacent elements in like a 2D array. So that to me is a very superficial change. In the same way, like I consider like two pointer as also including some descriptors like uh, your fast and slow pointer for like link lists or even like arrays, right? Still two pointers, right? Maybe even your like sliding window, right? Your sliding window goes like this. You see, I got two fingers, two pointers, right? And so these kind of two pointery problems, they're actually some of my least favorite in that I, I kind of struggle with these. 
in that like two pointer problems are usually in some form of like a linear list. So that could be like a linked list or an array or a string. And there's so much like variation within especially array and string problems that it's kind of hard sometimes to identify what tool to use. In other words, like I can give you an array and string problem that's a DP problem, right? <laughs> I could give you an array and string problem that's recursive backtracking. I can also give you one that's two pointer. So when it comes to your, your two pointer strategy, I felt like I needed to add this one to the list because it's so fundamentally different from the other ones on this list, right? Two pointer never tends to be recursive unless it's some you know, amalgamation of multiple uh, problem types together, which is an advanced problem, right? Um, so two pointer is kind of a must have on this list for that reason. And typically, you know, by implementing something using this kind of two pointer strategy, you're able to get right into that like Goldilocks state of like, this is going to be a linear runtime. Typically you can use two pointer to avoid the polynomial and squared type of thing and getting back down to that linear. I like it. So to review, the five core ideas are DFS, BFS, dynamic programming, recursive backtracking, and two pointer and you've mm -hmm. done a really amazing job of breaking that down in the videos on taro and on structy i'll leave links for all that below i think one common a, a very obvious follow-up will be okay i'm going through your course i'm going through your videos how do i know if i'm making progress what does it feel like to understand these concepts at a deeper and deeper level do you have thoughts absolutely absolutely i think anyone making this journey to, from like beginner to intermediate to eventually like mastery of like data structures and algorithms, it's going to feel tough. So I can tell you maybe the opposite, like <laughs> what is a misconceived impression of like mastery? You should not expect to like go through a course or do problems and expect to solve them first try every time. Like the number of learners that, that you know, post in my discord or DM me kind of existentially like, oh my gosh, I'm going through the course. Like every time you present an algorithm in the videos and draw it out, I understand it, it makes sense. But then when I have a new topic, like, I don't know what to do. And to me, it's like, well, yeah, <laughs> no one showed it to you yet, you know? So I think having the patience and understanding that like you're, and I certainly am not, <laughs> but most mere mortal engineers like ourselves, we're not going to come up with like the topological sort just from our own brain. I'm not going to come up with like Dijkstra's algorithm or even you know, backtracking. I know it because I had to struggle through it and learn it before. What progress should feel like is, all right, I had trouble with this, you know, backtracking problem. I had to use the videos. I even had to look at like the solution and I had some bugs. So it was probably not, wouldn't be a pass if this was an interview, but thankfully it's not an interview. This is just practice, right? So tomorrow, a week later, go back to that problem. You should be better the next time you do it. You should get unstuck maybe a little further along solving that problem. And I think progress should feel like eventually reaching the state where you can solve the problem like on your own. You don't need my video. You don't need to look at the solution. And hopefully you don't have any bugs when you run the test cases. But understanding that it's okay to get stuck and it's okay to use these resources is really the key. One of the things that I hear a lot from people on Taro or just engineers in general is it's a lot of luck involved with DSA mm. interviews. You're a humble guy, I can tell, Alvin. <laughs> I want you to put aside the humility for a minute. Yes. If you went and tomorrow or next week you did a hundred interviews at Bank, Google, Facebook type companies. I am curious, what would your pass rate be? Like, would you kind of fly through them and pass every single one? Or do you think like even someone like you who clearly has a deep mastery on the topic, mm -hmm. would you still end up uh, failing a couple of the interviews? Sure. Yeah, ab absolutely. So I think luck is definitely a component of it. And, and to me, like, how does that luck formula come about? Well, it's some function of, you know, the topics that you've studied before, right? And also the problems that you practice and what they're going to give you. For example, I'm very opinionated on how to prepare for these, these interviews, right? So like there are things that even when I am looking for a job, I will not study because I know that there are certain topics like red black trees that like if they give that on an interview, I'm okay with failing that because I'm not gonna spend a week learning this and how to implement it because it's a lot of code. It's also kind of unreasonable to ask in like a 45 minute session. So I go into my interviews knowing that there are some problems on leak code because there are a lot of esoteric problems on leak code that I have no interest in solving. And if I get those, it's all good. But luckily that that kind of luck factor could be balanced out by the fact that usually you're given multiple rounds. Even in my own like Google interview set, even when I got the job, right down in uh, 2021, there was like one session where I myself felt like this was probably gonna be a no. The most I could probably get is a neutral, definitely not a positive performance, definitely not a strong hire. So I think if I took like a hundred interviews to answer your question, you know, maybe like 20 of them might be like no pass, 
like 10 to 20 of them. The more, the more you interview, like <laughs> the better you'll be at them, the better you'll be at them. I think one of the really strong themes I'm taking away from here is very much the 80, 20 rule. Like literally you just said it yeah. like, Hey, you oh yeah, I actually did. Much. Yeah. I mean, you know, these concepts super well, um, yeah. and you're optimizing for the 80% of like, Hey, yes. these are like the most common concepts that are being talked about in an interview. And even the five core ideas that you sent me ahead of time, that's very much abiding by the 80, 20 rule. And I think that's such exactly. a good way to study and avoid getting overwhelmed by the whole infinite universe of possible algorithm questions you might get asked. Learn from these experts. And so that's why I'm so super excited to be able to have a lot of that content that you've put out and host it on Taro in a course. I'll leave a link for that. Where, where can people find you online? Yeah, so you can find me. I have a YouTube channel, first and foremost, right? I have a channel. It's called Alvin the Programmer. We'll leave a link in the description. You can also find me on LinkedIn, also in the description. But most importantly, you know, if you found value in this conversation and you've also maybe enjoyed my uh, other teaching uh, videos on channels like Free Code Camp, uh, you can find me at Structy.net, where I have my own curated course to take you from zero to hero for data structures and algorithms. Okay, perfect. I will leave links for all of that in the description. Thanks so much, Alvin, and have a great uh, rest of your day. Have a great trip. Awesome. Thanks.